In this video, I want to provide an introduction to the beta distribution. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about, first of all, defining what is meant by the beta distribution. Then importantly, we're going to talk about why might we want to use the beta distribution as a way of specifying prior knowledge about a situation and, and, and in what circumstances would we want to do that. And finally, we're going to talk about the range of beliefs which we can actually specify by varying the parameters of our beta distribution. So first of all, if we start off by defining what the beta distribution is, it's a distribution which is defined in terms of a parameter theta or our variable theta. It's a continuous distribution, which is a function of two parameters, a and b, and it's of the form theta to the power a minus one times one minus theta to the power b minus one all divided through by a normalization constant, which is a beta function of a and b, these two parameters. And note that the denominator here is not a function of the variable theta, and it's kind of just like a normalization constant, which ensures that the probability distribution integrates to one. So what we can do is we can really think about this distribution as being proportional to theta to the power a minus one times one minus theta to the power b minus one. And I should say that this distribution is only defined for theta lying in the sort of range of 0 to 1. OK, so why might we actually choose to use the beta distribution to specify prior knowledge about a parameter theta? Well, one of the reasons is that this distribution is only defined for theta in the range 0 to 1. So a beta distribution is a very natural distribution to use when we're talking about probabilities and we want to specify what is our prior knowledge about the probability of something occurring. And we'll also see in the range of beliefs that we can actually specify a very sort of quite a large range of beliefs by changing these parameters a and b. Okay so let's go through and look at how this function is likely to change as we change a and b. So let's start off with a circumstance where a is a half and b is also a half. In that circumstance, our distribution here, the probability of theta as a function of a and b, is going to be proportional to theta to the power minus a half times one minus theta to the power minus a half as well, because b minus one is also minus a half, which is just the same as one over theta to the power a half, if I can actually write, times one minus theta to the power a half as well. So what we can see here is that if theta equals zero, then I'm going to have one divided through by zero here, so we're going to have infinity. So there's going to be an issue with an asymptote at theta equals zero. And also if theta equals one, this second term is going to equal zero. So we're also going to have an asymptote there. So what we're going to imagine is going to happen here if we draw it, if we've got sort of one here and zero here, then we imagine that the distribution is going to look something like that which I'm drawing now. Then if we think about the circumstance when we keep a at a half and now we increase b to one, now our probability distribution is proportional to, if I write it down, it's proportional to theta is still to the power minus a half, but this second term here is now, well, b minus 1 is now 0, so this whole sort of second dependence on 1 minus theta disappears. So our distribution is just proportional to 1 over theta to the power of half. So in the second case here, if I sort of write this on our diagram here, the probability distribution is going to look something like this mauve line which I'm drawing here. So again, there's going to be an asymptote at 0, but it's not going to be symmetric like the previous example. And we could reason due to the symmetry of this problem that it will be exactly the same sort of flipped around the other way if I was to increase a to one and keep b at a half. But let's not go into that case just because it's, it's pretty much exactly the same example. Let's now think about the case when both a is one and b is one. In that circumstance, we've got that the probability of theta given a and b is proportional to, well, this first term, theta to the power a minus one, is just going to be theta to the power zero, so that's just a constant. And the second term is also going to be one minus theta to the power zero, which is also a constant. So the probability is just a constant across our range. 
So what does that mean? Well, it means that we're actually going to get out the sort of uniform probability density, and it's just going to be uniform across 0, 1, and it's going to be at a value of 1, hence that the area, or so that the area rather, integrates up to 1. So already we're starting to see that we can specify a range of different prior beliefs about this probability just by varying the parameters a and b. Let's now increase a and b a bit more, so let's increase a and b to 3. In that circumstance, we, what do we have? We have that the probability of theta given a and b is proportional to, or theta to the power a minus 1 is just theta squared, times 1 minus theta all squared. And we can see here that essentially when theta is 0 and when theta is 1, the probability density is going to be 0. So it's going to start off at the origin and it's going to finish up at the point 1, 0. And we could reason through and we could actually differentiate to find that this thing actually has a maximum at the value of a half. So if we were to draw on this probability distribution, it would look something like this blue line, which I'm drawing here. And what we would find is that if we increased a and b even further, we would actually make this distribution even more pointed towards the value at a half until the point at which you know, a and b were infinite, it would just be a delta function at the value of a half. However, you don't necessarily have to increase both a and b. It turns out that if we were to sort of think about the mean of the beta distribution, the expected value of theta turns out to be a over a plus b. So if you increase a without increasing b, then the idea is that the distribution will be slanted more and more towards the one line here. Okay, so I don't want you to take my word for it, so what I've actually done is I have coded up this beta distribution in MATLAB, and I now want to show you some simulations from this beta distribution. Okay, so we're starting off with the case of when a and b are a half. If we run this distribution here, we see exactly what we'd expect to see. We've got these two asymptotes at the theta equals 0 and theta equals 1 line, so that's just as we expect. Then if I increase b to 1, keeping a at a half, what we'll see is that the distribution is essentially skewed towards 0 with just an asymptote at 0, and then the PDF goes through the sort of point theta equals 1 and PDF taking on a value of 0. If we then increase a to 1, we then find exactly what we were expecting to find before, which is that the distribution actually is a uniform distribution on 0, 1. If we then increase both a and b to 3, we should expect to see that the distribution is peaked at a value of a half, which is exactly what we find. And as I said before, if we increase both a and b towards a sort of higher number, I'm using 10 here, we're going to see that the distribution is even more pointed towards the value of a half. And also, just to demonstrate that essentially if we change one of these parameters, we are going to actually slant the distribution to be peaked at a slightly different point. If I increase b to 20 here, we find that the distribution is sort of shifted towards the left, which is what we expect from examining the mean. The mean of this process is a over a plus b. So if we increase b, then that's going to decrease the mean of this process. So the distribution is slanted over that way. And then if we increase a, so now if I increase a to 20 and decrease b to 10, then it will be slanted just exactly the other way. So I hope that I've convinced you that the beta distribution is a way of specifying a range of different beliefs about a probability and that by changing a and b, we can capture essentially most situations which we would like to cover in terms of prior beliefs. There are some caveats to that though, and that's the fact that we can't specify bimodal sort of beliefs about values of theta. So what do I mean by bimodal? I mean that imagine the circumstance whereby we thought that the distribution was peaked towards a value of a quarter and the value of a three quarters, for example, as well. We can't specify that type of belief via a beta distribution, so we'd have to look to a different distribution or perhaps just do it numerically. But the beta distribution is still a pretty good distribution for specifying these types of belief, and it has the nice property that it is conjugate to binomial and Bernoulli random variables, meaning that the posterior distribution in those circumstances 
is also a beta distribution.